so good. Such a high honor to be here today. I, let me say, as long as I've been doing 32 years of this, I didn't even know this existed back here. <laughs> I, was, I was telling Riley, we were walking and kept going around. I said, where are we going? He said, oh, it goes all the way around. Now, before I was saved, when me getting in the dark, I said, is this is where you can hide the bodies. You know what I'm saying? Good God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those kind of things. My wife is here, Kathy, take, uh, just say something to, real quick. You say a lot to me, so say something to them. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> can't take a break, Sorry. brother. You can't take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be instant in season and Amen. out of season around this place. So good to be here with all of you evangelists in the room. Hallelujah. You know, the very first, I, I was actually, I didn't realize it when I got born again that God called me to be an evangelist because this was the first one that I evangelized to the <laughs> Lord. So, and it stuck Look, after all of these years. But uh, we just fell in love with Jesus so long ago. My, I got born again in May of 1973. So I'm coming up against 50 years of knowing the Lord, and it's been sweeter every single day. We're excited to be here. God bless you. Hallelujah. Give her a hand clap. That's Kathy. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, I know a little bit about evangelism, and I want to start off with this so you'll understand what I'm talking about. There's a five-fold ministry, the apostle, the prophet. Hey, how y'all doing? Excuse me. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> well, hey, we don't say <laughs> I mean, I, I start talking to people I know. Praise God. Anyway, there's the apostle, there's the prophet, there's the evangelist, there's the pastor, and the teacher. And I've had people over the years say, what's the most important one? Because they always said it was the apostle, you know, or prophet. But if you really think about it, none of this would, would exist without the evangelist. If you notice in the Old Covenant, there weren't evangelists, there were prophets. And you notice there was no, uh, 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 it, it, you never really formed the church. You had a temple, but nobody really cared about it to keep the law. But it never brought people together. Think about that for a minute, because all them people before Jesus died, resurrected and ascended. That's why they couldn't keep the law, because they weren't born again. Nobody was born again until Jesus breathed upon them. That's what I've been speaking about in the main sanctuary there. Uh, receive you the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, which was the wind of life when he breathed. Just like when he breathed in Adam and in his nostrils became a living soul. Breathe. And then in the Holy Ghost, that's the wind of power, like I've been talking about in that. So you, you have life and power coming together, see? To work, So there's not one more important than the other because you have to flow in all five. But without the evangelist, you don't have the church. A teacher can't teach nobody. A pastor can't pastor no one. A prophet can't prophesy to nobody. An apostle don't know where to go because he's a sent one. <laughs> See my point? See, but yet they are interlinked and, and, and go forth. So I want to talk a little bit about that. There's all kinds of evangelism. And I came out of what I call radical evangelism. Which is mean on the streets, a lot of people get hit, and more than I've been, I've been throwing a punch, I mean, you name it, just do it, especially doing Mardi Gras. <laughs> you know, when they're all just screaming and hollering, two million drunk people on the street and half of them naked. You gotta have God in your life when everybody's running around naked. <laughs> it's good. What you're focusing on, you understand what I'm trying to say? So when you understand, going out there and getting somebody saved is wonderful, but you can't stop there. Because if you leave them out by themselves, any baby that you leave on the street is going to die. You have to direct them into what I call the church, the body of Christ. And you do that by the attraction of your spirit. I said that today. Was anybody in my session today? That your spirit will attract you and your anointing will keep them. It will attract people and keep them. But I want to read a scripture, if I can, in uh, Matthew chapter 9. If you want, you can go to it, you can. And I really love this, and it's, a, um, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9. Let me get to it myself. I was at a different place right here. Matthew chapter 9, I want to start reading with um, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching. Some people say, I don't preach, I'm a teacher. Well, you got to be biblical. You got to do both. God requires us to do it all, even though you may be, sanctioned to do, you'll have one like one gift of the Spirit that's more dominant in your life, but you should be able to flow in all nine. You, you, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, but some people say, well, I can't. No, 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 no. You can do all things. No, no. And when somebody tells you they can't, that's just smoke. You can do all things. Let me read that again. Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That means God's way of doing and being right and healing every sickness, not some of them healing every sickness and every disease among the people. 
So you got to understand that we all have responsibilities to do things that God tells us to do. He, he loves this world. For God so loved the world. I never forget when the Lord said, he said, Jesse, go get me the world. I want this world. I said, you. Yeah. He, 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 well, he, okay, Kat, you want to preach this or you want me? <laughs> yeah, when you've been married 52 years, you just got to take the hits and they just keep on coming. <laughs> Praise God. Yes, he said, make me wealthy. I'm going to get that. I swear to God. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> That's why I bring her. She keeps me on my toes. Praise God. All right. The Lord told me in prayer, he said, keep and make me wealthy. I said, make you wealthy? How can I make you? I said, Lord, look like you're doing pretty good. I mean, you got gold streets, diamond, barrel, jasper, onyx, ruby, pearly gates. One pearl, one gate. Pretty big. Can you imagine how big that oyster is? Oh, with hot sauce on it, <laughs> suck that out the shell, <laughs> glory to God. Hallelujah. And I said, Lord, I think you're doing pretty good. He said, I don't count my wealth that way. I count my wealth by the souls I possess. Now make me wealthy. Because the only Jesus some people will ever see is the Jesus in you or the Jesus in me. You've heard me say that many times if you follow my ministry. Now look what Jesus said here in Matthew uh, chapter 9. I like this right here. Verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Are you moved with compassion? Compassion will produce passion. He was moved with compassion on them because they were fainted and were gathered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he saith unto his disciples. That's what I want to talk about. This is the church's vision on evangelism. He said in verse 37, then he saith he unto the disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. So it's out there. That's spiritual, physical, and financial. No shortage of money. None. Just in the wrong hands. See what I'm saying? No shortage of people being born again. But most of the time people leave them on the streets. And they die out. Because there's wolves and things that come to destroy. The harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. In that little, those two verses is three things. The opportunity of the church. The harvest truly is plenteous. The need of the church. The laborers are few. The resource of the church. Pray ye therefore the Lord. The resource is that God evidently thinks we can touch the world. I was praying not too long ago when I get in these time warps. It was about two or three years ago. And me and Kenneth are real good friends as well as, you know, ministers. You know, we've been preaching together a long time. And, uh, you know, he's believing God for a million partners. And I thought, man, a million people, a lot of people. Now, I don't mean to sound proud. My ministry, as far as partnership, is bigger than some television networks. We have 422,000 partners. Not bragging about that, just God. Said they're attracted to me. <laughs> my spirit attracts them. My anointing keeps them. That's why you don't break trust. You can't say, well, I couldn't help myself. I messed up. Yo, mama, you can help yourself. That's a lie. You know, so when you understand what this means, the opportunity, the need, and the resource, God thinks we can touch this world. So I was praying, and I said, Lord, I'm going to believe you for a million partners, too. And the Lord spoke something to me, shocked me. He said, why would you limit me? Now, I'm going to tell you something, people, a million people, that's a lot of people. Why would you limit me? He said, there's 7.8 billion people on this planet. And you're only asking me for a million partners? Why would you limit me, who is unlimited? I said, forget what I said. He said, I just did. <laughs> he expunged that from his mind. So when you got born again, God doesn't know anymore that you ever were a sinner. Because your record has been expunged like it never happened. Now that's powerful. You see what I'm saying? So I want to deal first. He said that the harvest truly is spent. The opportunity of the church. So the whole church, people say, well, my church is not growing because you're not doing nothing. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. You may be able to preach. But what I'm saying is, are you able to gather harvest? See, a lot of people are like this. See, they think it's the pastor's job to make the church grow. No, no, no. It's the sheep's job. Sheep begat sheep. Pastors, preachers, they feed them. You see what I'm saying? Now, notice the difference between God the Father 
and God the Son. When God called people, he called shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Notice that, shepherds. But when Jesus came upon the scene, he didn't call any shepherds. He called fishermen. See, the, in the Old Covenant, the, uh, Israel needed leading and guiding. In the New Testament, the world needs catching. See, to bring people into this. That's what evangelism is all about. Now, there's, already, there's some, there, uh, people say, are you an evangelist? Well, I'm a revivalist to the church and an evangelist to the world. Now, Brother Copeland said, just a prophet. He got the prophetic aid. And I can flow in that, see. But I understand that God may want me to move in, any, in anyone at any time. And I can, beyond not sounding bragging, I can teach this Bible. I prefer to preach it. Teachers explaining, preachers proclaiming. So the opportunity of the church is this. And if you want to take it, write this down, you can. The world is worth winning for Christ. I just said this. He counts his wealth by the souls he possesses. Now, let me give you a prime example of how powerful one soul is. And you may have done this today. Didn't somebody, how many people would touch the 82? 82 this morning. Let me show you. There was a, 82, now watch this. There was a man that went and do a revival in North Carolina. And he thought he was a total, complete failure because only one person was saved in the whole revival. It, it went one week long. Yeah. And he thought, man, I mean, I did the best I could. I could get one. But that one that got saved was Billy Graham. <laughs> and when God exploded Billy's ministry, that man that led him to the Lord just cried. See, you never see what God sees. The value of an individual. Like y'all heard me talking the other day when I was talking to that prostitute. People freak out. He talks to prostitutes. Well, they talk to me. And I had made up my mind, who told you that's all you could do? Somebody done warped your sense of thinking. You know, because God don't create bad people. His people may go bad. People say, you know, bad things happen to good people. I disagree with that. Good people happen to bad things. Okay, let me get on this side because y'all didn't get that. Okay. Say bad people happen to the good. No, no, no. Good people happen on bad things sometimes. In those different things. See, it's a reversal of things. So when I realized how much the Lord loved the world, I said, how much do you love? He said, I so love the world that I let my son die for you. So there was a big business meeting before all of this was ever created. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. This is evangelism. He said, I'm going to create a species of people that angels, the wheel within the wheel, they've never seen this before. And it's called the human race. And I'm going to love them with every fiber of my being. This is Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh, Father. Who, all, who is. His name is I Am. Which means they ain't no more. But it, that's a good a translation. If you want to look at I Am. And he said, I'm going to love them so much. Now he's having this meeting with the Son. And he's having this meeting with the Holy Ghost. He said, they're going to mess up. Jesus said, Father, because I love you so much, I'll get them all back. The father said, you dead. Now, begin. See, Jesus didn't die 2,000 years ago on the cross. That was his physical death. He was a lamb led to the slaughter before the foundations of the earth. God had evangelism on his mind before they ever sinned. Do you see that? So the world is worth winning for Christ. He counts his wealth by the souls he possesses. Now watch that. For God so loved, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, cause of salvation. That's why you went out today. That he gave his only begotten son, cost of salvation. That whosoever believeth in him, condition of salvation. Should not perish. They didn't say would not. said should not perish, but have everlasting life. Consequence. So when you went out and, and touched 82 people, that was cause, cost, condition, Consequence. Now, right now, somebody's walking the streets of Fort Worth that's born again Amen. in Pampers. <laughs> now, they're liable to mess up. That's why you got Pampers. <laughs> now, what do we do with these people? Did you direct them to churches? 
Did you direct them where they can be fed? Because I don't care how beautiful the baby is, if it doesn't eat, it dies. See, that is the opportunity of the church. And people are always asking me, but Jesse, uh, when you're going to retire, do I look tired? <laughs> how do you revoke an irrevocable gift? Now, if you think all we're going to do is what's on this planet, you don't know much about God's creation. We're this speck of nothing in the Milky Way galaxy. Yet he flung the stars with his hand. And now they say, they used to think 400 billion galaxies with 400 billion planet moons and stars. Now they're thinking 4 trillion because of the Hubble telescope and the new one, the James Webb telescope. It's out there. So I'm not going to stop being a minister of the gospel event. I don't know what's going to happen out there. I may be over, or he may send me to another galaxy. <laughs> kind of freaking you out, huh? <laughs> because if there's only us in this whole universe, it's a show big waste of space. And the reason why they think we will never meet aliens is because we think in terms of time travel and the fastest we think we can go is the speed of light. They tell you that now. Some of the greatest, what they say, you can't go any faster than the speed of light. Well, you don't, you don't travel by the speed of light once you're in heaven. You travel by the speed of thought. You think, you're dead. In the universe, boom. Now they're saying there's multiple universes. So what's in them? God doesn't create anything waste and void. Now you want me to prove that to you? Where was Satan when he died, when he sinned? He was in heaven. No, he wasn't. He was on the earth. He was here. He was ruling something here. And if we could excavate the bottoms of the oceans of the, of the world, we would find whoever he was ruling. He, see, he was here. He wasn't there. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt myself above the most high God. I will sit in the congregation of North. And because he tried to go up, he went down. You see, so he was here. Where's God going to send you? You think you just... Getting people saved on the streets of Fort Worth because you got nothing to do this week? Do you realize that God may be forming your future for eternity? My God. Think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. The eternity of eternities. See, that's the opportunity of the church. Watch this. As far as God's concerned, the harvest is truly plenteous. But to get people saved, you don't walk up to them like this. And say, hello, would you like to meet Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? He'll come into your life and you can be just like me. You know. uh -uh. There's not much compassion or passion in that. You got to show them life. Because remember, everyone you talked today was spiritually dead. And it was through your words that God breathed. The wind of life. Adams and Eve were created today as God breathed that wind of life through your testimony to them. That's why it's so important that we keep them. You see what I'm saying? That's the opportunity of the church. That's why I preach all the time. Now, should I rest myself? I, I, I got the grace. Sometimes I, I go a little overboard. Like one time I told the Lord, well, not too long ago, I said, Jesus. He said, what? I said, I'm tired. He said, sleep. <laughs> exact words. I said, I could have thought of that. He said, why didn't you? <laughs> and, and I never could take a nap in my life. Uh, and, and, uh, but now, Kathy, start, she's, they, they tell me when, they, when I come in and they can tell, Jody, my daughter, will say, Dad, go home. You need to take a nap. These little power naps, they call them, whatever you call them. And they're about 20 minutes, but when you, well, my God, you get a little, huh? But when you wake up, man, you feel like, here I come to save the day. <laughs> you mighty mouse, you know, you're on the way. <laughs> a little power that. You young people have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but mark my words, it's coming. <laughs> That's the opportunity. He said, but the laborers are few. <sighs> That's the need. How do you get people like yourself to do what you're doing and keep doing? Now, no matter what happens, not just at a, a believer's convention. This is when you go home. Like one man said, I'm called to Africa. I said, if you can't get your neighborhood saved, what makes you think you can get Africa saved? <laughs> Don't shout me down. See what I'm saying? So that's the need of the church. You can write this down. Unless you have a feeling of compassion or passion, you will have no spiritual effort. You may be able to paint a flower, 
but nobody can smell the fragrance because it's a facade. There's something about me. People say, there's something about that guy. When I walk in, not that I'm something. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about what's in me. Forget about this. It's what's in me. See, my spirit has a very hard time fitting in this body. It's like this. Because I'm very tall inside. <laughs> this is my message. I'm going to preach it the way I want to preach it. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? You see, you may be able to paint a flower. Look, look at this. Oh, this is a prime example. Look at this. Somebody took a picture of a city, but I, I can't touch that building. You see, there are a lot of churches, they're painting flowers with no fragrance. You can tell. Uh, 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 do you know Jesus? I'm a Baptist. You didn't ask that. <laughs> I'm a Methodist Episcopalian. Think, think of the confusion, especially in Asian people. How do you understand Christianity? You all believe in the same God, yet you can't go to the same church. That don't make any sense to the Asian mind. I mean, how do you, you do that? Well, you know, we, we don't believe what they believe. Yeah, but you serve the same Jesus. Well, yeah, but we don't believe. They're wrong. Like one man told me one time, I said, what, what, what denomination? I go to the church of Christ. Think about this. If you, if you had a church, wouldn't you name it and you were Jesus, the church of Christ? I said, what about the guys in Cleveland, Ohio, the church of God? Right. Are we better than that? We're the assemblies of God. <laughs> How about this? We're the church of God of prophecy in Christ. <laughs> you see? There's only really one name that means it all, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And everything on the earth, above the earth, and below the earth bows at that name. So to get people saved and to keep them saved and to get people to do the work, you have to have passion and compassion about it, see? See, yeah, but, but man, it's not working fast enough. I understand that. Vision, if you're writing, taking notes, write this down. Vision always runs in advance of our ability to fulfill it. Your vision will always be ahead of you. Because every time you think you're going to win, God moves the goalposts. See, I, 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 I want to go to the goal so I can dance. Hey, you know, like, like a touchdown. And God go, he said, all of a sudden I find I'm on another football field on the one yard line. And I hear the Holy Ghost say, set. <laughs> Wait a minute, I hadn't danced yet. I, 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 I. You see, God is forever increasing. Ever. Spiritually, physically, financially. Let me give you a promise. And people don't even realize. Everybody's so worried about asteroids. If we knew how to catch them, because they can destroy a planet. They're full of gold. They're worth trillions and trillions of dollars. Gold, silver, magnesium, iron. Yeah. That, if we could just, you know, if we could catch them, why not they hitting the planet and explode it? And you know what they are? God's garbage. That's his garbage. Those, those asteroids didn't come together and make a planet. That's just garbage. And you got the asteroid belt. You go further out, you got the Kuiper belt. Now, if everybody understood his garbage, just think about if you saw his house. And you worried about your light bill? You worried about, I don't know if I have enough money to go to college. What? You see, the labor is a few. The need of the church. So vision always runs in advance of your ability to fulfill it. I'm ever increasing constantly. And I'll do it till Jesus comes or I'll go by the way of the grave. You're not afraid to die, Brother Jesse? Why would I be afraid of something I ain't never done? If you th and I've been down on three airplane crashes. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Whoa. <laughs> you got it, baby. But if you think that I'm going to spend the last few seconds or a minute screaming full of fear. Ah! As you no, not me, baby. Since I'm going to die anyway, hey! <laughs> Hallelujah! I, I love the Lord. I had a great life. Glory to God. I'll shout till he hits the ground. Amen. Instead of going like that. <laughs> Why? Because when you know that Satan can't kill you, Amen. that Jesus is the way, you can't get lost. Amen. If Jesus is the truth, you cannot be deceived. And if Jesus is the life, the devil can't kill you. That's why Paul says, Whew, finally, I'm ready to be off it. Most people have been like, oh, Jesus, they're going to kill me. 
He said, I fought a good fight, boy, didn't I? And let me tell you something, baby, I finished my course. And I kept the faith. Now, he tells all these guys about ready to cut himself. Cut his head. He said, and, and I have a crown of righteousness laid up for me. They can't take his head off because that crown's got to go there. Amen. I'll show you how you know when you won. When you should be complaining in jail and everybody's writing you and you sending out letters of nothing but passion and encouragement and blessing. Amen. You see my point? So what you did today was phenomenal. It's what started God off in creating us. That's a very important thing you did. So we need more laborers. Now, 7.8 billion people. There's two scriptures in the Bible I always kind of tried to intellectualize in my mind. It was hard. He said he could save a nation in a day. I thought, well, how can he do that? And here's another one. All eyes will see him. I've traveled all over the world. Right now, there's some places it's dark. I said, how that's going to happen? Well, let me tell you who made that come to pass. Elon Musk. He just put 156 satellites up so that everyone could have internet. And each one of them have cameras on it. So when Jesus is coming out of these, all he got to do is this. And he's like, hey. <laughs> How you change a nation today? 7.8 billion people on the planet. You can preach to all of them in seven minutes. Now, those scriptures are fulfilled. Amen. Why is China going nuts? Why is Russia going nuts? Read the news. Gog and Magog. Why is Iran hating Israel and everybody? Read the news. This is the news. This is the real thing. This is not fake news. Amen. This is not made up through a journalistic point of view. This is. So there's the opportunity of the church. The harvest truly is plenty. That's why I don't get discouraged. How many of you have been watching me for years? Have you ever saw me sad? Nope. Sick? Nope. Depressed? Nope. Discouraged? Nope. Despondent? Nope. Broke? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> hey, glory to God. Why? How can you live like that? And they asked Kathy about me, is he like that? She he said, like that all the time. One time I was dreaming. I was in a tent meeting preaching. I mean, I was shucking corn and balling potatoes, but I was preaching. And I was saying, energize, immobilize, and finalize. And I woke up, and I was standing up in the bed, and there was a ceiling fan. <laughs> and Kathy woke up and grabbed me, get the fool up. Get down, boy. <laughs> I said, you should have seen this meeting. You know what the Lord told me? Make it come to pass. You can take a dream and make it become a living reality. Oh. Why? That's opportunity. So when I see a sinner, I go, oop, fresh meat. <laughs> when I see an irritating, no count piece of trash Christian, you know some. Ah, opportunity. There's all kinds of Christians, you know. There's some good ones, and you got their mother guys. Well, you want me to prove it? Paul the Apostle. Alexander the coppersmith. He done me much harm. The Lord going to reward him in his day. So with Paul, he had to kind of pray over, get a little bit of love. Jesus, kill him. Just kill Alexander. I mean, you know, no, we're going to get him saved. The beloved John the Apostle, who was called Son of Thunder. He get mad. He turned around. He said, Jesus, you want me to call fire out of them and burn all these people in here? Don't that sound like a Pentecostal? I want to see an Ananias and Sapphira. Somebody bite the dust. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. <laughs> Done. <laughs> no, I don't want to see that. All of us have that. Now, I'm going to tell you something going to shock you. And I may say it here. And don't judge me yet. Let me finish it, okay? <laughs> Jesus, uh, well, he's God in the flesh. But Jesus had a little gangster in him. He's a little gangster in him. Not in a bad way. He had enough. When Jesus had enough, I'm going to make you an offer you don't refuse. <laughs> Here comes Saul of Tarsus, the bloodthirsty persecutor. Jesus comes down there, slap the boy off the donkey. <laughs> Whap! Just knock him on the ground. And I'll paraphrase it. You want to dance with me? <laughs> you want some of this? Come on, sucker. Let's see what you got. Why are you persecuting me? 
And I was this big bad boy named Saul of Tarsus. He goes, Lord. <laughs> Say, you get slapped off your donkey, you're going to call him Lord. Right. Right. They tried to push Jesus off a cliff. He said, get out of my face. And he just walked right through him. <laughs> Jesus was no wimp, ladies and gentlemen. And neither was his mama. <laughs> Mary was one tough woman. The Bible says she pondered these things in her heart. Now, do you understand something about Jesus that he had to learn to be human? You have to learn to be spirit. Am I going too long? Okay. I love it. Yeah. He didn't know how to be human. He never was human. You don't know how to be spirit. You never were spirit. You were dead. And when he breathed that, whoo, that wind of life into you. You got to learn it every day. What's pushing you out there is your spirit through a renewed soul, mind, will, and emotion in a crucified body. You see what I'm saying? He had to learn to be human. He didn't know what pain was till he got hurt. He went, wow. Sin? Oh. Wait a minute. What is this? But he learned it. And you hear him in the garden get sent to me. Oh, man, this is one tough oh. If this cup can pass from, and he stops himself, and he proves the Pauline revelation before it's ever wrote, not my will but thine be done, he crucifies his flesh, and he focuses toward the cross. Amen. He, and the garden got sent to me, he understood his message. He actually developed the grace message right there. And Paul picked it up through revelation later on. See, Jesus realized that the Father had a need, and that need was us. For God so loved the world. Now, I like John 3, 16, but I like John 3, 17 better. He didn't come in the world to condemn the world. How many times have you seen Christians condemn people? Why would you do that? Since when did you become a judge? What school did you go to? And I'm going to tell you something about Jesus. A lot of people don't even realize that. Since his ascension, he ain't judged a person. He's not a judge. He's a savior. Now he's going to turn into a judge. And right now he can fix everything that needs fixing. But when he, when he puts on them judges' robes, then sentencing is coming down. He can't change it no more. So if there's an opportunity and then there's a need, then what's the resource? Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers in his heart, which means we don't have enough. What we ought to have is as many people in that main sanctuary, or whatever you call that thing, uh, convention center, whatever, ought to be that many on the streets right. while there are that many in here. Right. Where are all the other churches? Why? Why aren't they here? Because they don't understand unity. Well, it's not a Baptist convention. It's them word of faith, prosperity people. No, we're your brother and your sister. Whether you believe that or not. He said, I really think we could touch the world in a day if all of us would put our doctrinal differences aside and just simply preach Jesus and let your light shine. Amen. Well, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. I promise you, you never will. <laughs> I don't believe in healing. You just ain't got sick enough yet. I don't want prosperity, then go hungry. Everyone that preaches against that receives an offering, which makes no sense. That's an oxymoron. You ought to just get rid of your house, go live under a bridge. Because that's probably the only time you're ever going to be, be debt free. You know, the homeless are debt free. Takes a while in here, but you'll get it. They're debt free. Now, if you want to believe God to be debt free, why are you stopping there? The homeless are debt free. Why don't you believe God to be debt free? Now, this is an evangelism thought that you can get. And the amount of money that you were in debt, that's your house, your car, I don't know, whatever you got. Have that in liquid finance somewhere in an institution, bank somewhere. And uh, now you believe in something. Amen. Not only you're debt free, but you got the amount of money that you were in debt to be the blessing you want to be. Amen. See? Opportunity, 
need resource. Now, he who prays the most lives the best. Why? Because you keep yourself in what I was preaching a while ago, that faith cloud around you. I've had many opportunities to fail or don't take any. I have many opportunities to be discouraged. I'll just tell you what happened. We had one of the worst hurricanes we've ever had. I've been in a lot of hurricanes. Hurricane uh, Katrina was bad, but the one we went through last year was worse. Hurricane Ida, because we got right in the middle of the eye. We had 168 mile an hour gusts in my backyard and 145 to 150 mile an hour sustained wind. I mean wind, buddy. I saw trees flying. Roofs going, shingle. You go out there, you get hit, they're going to go right through you. Um, and, you know, me and Kathy, we, and I have a very strong house, I misunderstand. And here's the most amazing thing. Norman, when you got one, that's a cat, a cat five is 157 miles an hour. She was at 150. Well, seven miles an hour ain't that much different between a cat four and a cat five. You see what I'm saying? And Norman, I leave at that. And the Lord said, I want you to stay. And Riley, I just couldn't figure that out. You came down there, I believe you did. Yeah. Yeah. And y'all helped us get the trees out. Remember the trees that were blowing over? I mean, it was something down there, man. We all, we all begin to love blue. It's called blue roofs, tarps, everywhere you could get, you see. Now watch this. I just couldn't figure out. God said, I want you to stay. Now, and, and let, me, let me paraphrase that. In the last few years, and I thought it's because of my white hair, because of you know, my age or something like that. A lot of people now, they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, we've got one of God's generals here. I said, my oh God, is Kenneth here? <laughs> I turn around. I don't think of myself as no general. I think of myself as some buck private or something like that. I, I, I don't get into all this stuff. You know what I'm saying? But I, that's been happening the last 15 years, maybe 20 years. So when I, and I'm so glad I did stay, because the next day I'm in the streets praying with people and helping people. And people were coming up to me and say, uh, Reverend, can can get some water out your swimming pool? Water out my swimming pool? I got a big swimming pool. I said, yeah, five gallon bucket. I said, why do y'all want that? So we can flush our toilets. So all the water system is gone. There's no electricity. Everything's shut down. You begin to really learn something, buddy, quick when, you, when you're like that. I said, well, sure, get what you want. Yeah, I don't care. You know? And it's it just so amazing. So anyway, uh, I was there two days after the storm, and I'm helping people and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm the first one to go on Almond Boulevard where I live, and I mean, I'm dodging trees, and they're the first one to hit to the ministry to see if anything tore up, and the devil trying to rip the roof off the church, but he couldn't. He got the screws up about this high, but the Holy Ghost said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I said, Lord, he said, do you want to know why I told you to stay? I said, yeah. He said, generals don't leave. <laughs> Leaders don't leave. Leaders lead. Generals command. See what I'm saying? Now, evidently, God must think you people are really something because he gave you the most precious ability to fill his coffers with people that's going to miss hell because of you. Now, that's evangelism. In every which way, that is, that's the resource. Pray ye therefore to the Lord of the harvest. That's opportunity, that's need, that's resource. He who prays the most lives the best. Now, what is prayer? I'll, I'll say it like this. Prayer consists of gathering up the mind from its wanderings and placing it consciously in the presence of God. Have you ever started praying and then your mind starts drifting on you? You said, oh, Jesus, you know, I got to fix that refrigerator. Lord, I just thank you. You know, I never did really like that second board I, I, that came in my life. <laughs> you know, as you get older, you, know, you get pretty smart. You judge people pretty good. But my daughter, I only have one daughter, granddaughter. And when these boys begin to show up at the house, now I know what a boy is. I've been a boy and a heathen boy. I know what they're looking for. And it ain't to praise God. <laughs> this guy come up here. That's the ugliest boy I ever saw in my life. I said, he ain't getting close to my daughter. They're getting mad. That's going to be some ugly baby. We don't want no ugly baby. But that boy looked like a fish. He had a, he, his head looked this big, but when he looked, he was real skinny. He said, is Jody here? I said, oh, yeah. Can I see her? I said, no. I said, son, you got to go. And I only talk once. You understand? 
So Jody comes down and says, Daddy, was that for me? I said, no, that was not for you. <laughs> That's not for you. <laughs> now I got a 14-year-old daughter who looks 17. We don't like it. Because she's developing. And we don't like that neither. <laughs> but you can't stop that. In fact, Jody called me. She said, Dad, you a man of God, aren't you? Yes. I said, yes, I am. She said, can you stop this? I said, no, I can't. <laughs> this can't. So when a boy comes, I watch his eyes. Let's see what he's looking at. And how many times I've looked over and said, a little higher, buddy. A little higher. I said, let me tell you something about women. Women, I, I, this just blows me away how women think compared to men. I hugged a lady the other day, and she freaked out. She goes, oh, my God, I hope you didn't feel my back fat. I said, what did you say? Oh, I hope you didn't feel my back fat. Ladies, let me help you here. There ain't no man in the world saying, did you see the fat on that woman's back? They're not, they're looking a little lower. You got to go lower. I said, you got to just go lower. When you get lower, then you're going to find out what they're looking at. But it ain't your back. Back fat, for God's sake. It's okay to laugh. Go ahead. So you gotta, see, when evangelism, you disturb the devil, you got to make things light a little bit, see? <laughs> you know, so when you understand what God wants to do, he wants the world. We would already be in heaven if we would come together in the unity of the faith. That's what Paul said in his last statement. He said, fought a good fight, I finished my course. I love that. If you, any of y'all are pardoned in my ministry, anybody get my pardon? Notice how I end all my pardon lists? Keep the faith. Because you see... You can lose it. Do you know when God created the Garden of Eden, he didn't finish? He didn't. He had Adam and Eve there, and he says, uh, dress it and keep it. Ah, which means if you don't keep it, you can lose it. Think about that for a minute. Dress it and keep it. And when Jody was born, I have one daughter, one granddaughter. When Jody was born, I'll tell you what, you got to understand, I was, a, I was a rocker, you know, Jesus sandals, embroidery. I had a tie-dye T-shirt. I had a body in them days. I really didn't, not, not no more, but I mean, <laughs> those days. And I, when I saw her, I mean, I immediately left the hospital. She's the only one out of the whole De Plantis family that's a Texan. We all Cajun people. She was born in Arlington Memorial Hospital in Arlington, Texas. I went out and I bought this beautiful dress because I wanted her to look good when she came out of the hospital. And I remember when I got in, the nurses said, how can this hippie, crazy-looking rocker have such nice taste? <laughs> look at this dress. I said, well, look at my baby. <laughs> <laughs> now, you got to see it by faith. It's not the, see, this is all loose now. It's like, <laughs> don't laugh. Some of y'all are pretty loose yourself. <laughs> Some of y'all going to get loose, too. I want to let you know it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. You think that boy's got wonderful waves of air? One day he's going to have beaches. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> That's all right. He's in more fashion than I am. I had somebody tell me that today. Boy, you got some nice hair. Do you know? I got friends of mine when I went to my high school reunion. They looked at me and said, out of all them people, there was only three of us had hair, men. And I thought, why? And this one guy, he was a great football player. His name was Jerry, Jerry Abair. And, they, and I didn't hardly recognize him, bald as a peach. I said, Jerry, and he had thick hair. What happened to you? He said, a wife and four kids did this to me. <laughs> I said, but Jerry, you're in better style. You know, they got people right now, they got hair lying down there, and they shave it. So you had more fashion than I am. <laughs> Kathy wants me to spike my hair. She said, yeah, your hair looks like a helmet. <laughs> I said, well, a fly may need to land, and I, I got to have him a good runway or something like that. I don't know. Back to evangelism. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> this is the second time I've preached already. <laughs> you know? So what are you going to do this week? What I would love for you to do is lead those people to the Lord. Let them see you, not how good you can talk, but the love that's in your heart. And 
Direct them to a church. And they're going to say, well, I, I, that's kind of far out. Well, you drove to get drunk. You drive to a nice restaurant. You drive a long way to see a girl or see a boy. Why can't you drive to church? Well, you know, we, you know gas is expensive. We don't have enough money. Why don't you give God a job? God, I'll go to the church. You're going to have to fill my gas tank. Man, I got nothing. He said, I can handle that. You see, and let that evangelism flow. And it don't make no difference what country you live in. I mean, you don't even have to um, speak their language. And you know, evangelism can be just two words. God bless you. People go, huh? I opened up a door the other day for a lady in the mall. She went, oh, well, I ain't seen that in a long time. I mean, there's just something about it. They don't, they, don't, they, they don't see politeness anymore, you know. And I said, well, come on in, ma'am. And sometimes God will tell you to do things by faith. This is evangelism that you don't even know. And I'll say this and I'll close. I, I flew to Honolulu, Hawaii. I've been to Hawaii 107 times. Preaching all the time. I'm preaching all the time. I mean, I'm like, good. God, I, don't, I think I got about 40 different uh, requests to come in different churches all over. You know, and anyway, to make a long story short, my ministry is translating a lot of different languages. And I don't just put a crawler feed across it. Some, a lot of time, I haven't matched my lips. And when I was on TV, and that cost me $300 per program a week to do that. Plus, uh, uh, what do they call that? Uh, closed caption and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm in Japan. Anybody in here from Japan? If you go to Tokyo, you'll have to see me on the side of a bus in video. And I'm just preaching. Glory to God. Because they flew the, uh, of Sony and Ikigami when I bought these cameras. They flew to talk to me. Then I found out how much I was worth. I said, they flying from Tokyo? And they want me to buy these cameras. Well, why wouldn't they send their representatives? They got representatives in America. You can go buy something Sony right now, can't you? You can buy something. They came to heaven. And I thought, now this is $1.4 million per camera, and I got five of them. And they said, Reverend, now we, could we use your name? You know, because you and Joel Osteen had the finest cameras in the world, better than ABC, CBS, NBC. I'm not bragging, it's just truth. And I went, how much is worth to you? <laughs> oh. I said, you want me to write a letter or do a little and, and, and endorse your product? Yeah. Talk to me. <laughs> Let's talk price here. Right. Now, Jesus is Jewish. <laughs> you got to do business here. So they cut the prices down. And they put me on their buses. I go back to the Japanese language. So instead of the crawler feed, I'm going, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's amazing. I love watching it. It's so funny. And, and it's so funny to hear you going, I don't know what I'm saying. I said, but this is good. When I went to Rome, I walked and turned the television. I remember that, Kath? And there I was speaking in Italian. I want to tell you something. I want you to listen. <laughs> so I decided to go to the top. If you have been to Hilton, Hawaii, uh, there's a, a tower called the Rainbow Tower. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You've been? You been there. You know what I'm talking about. That's a tall tower. Beautiful place. So I, I want to go to the top of it and look at it and see how much I can see of Honolulu. You know, go out there. And I go in. And you know, Japanese people, they, they walk real fast, you know. Small steps, but boy, they can scoot. <laughs> she, boom, boom, she comes, in the, comes into the uh, elevator, you know. And, and I look at her and I said, uh, what floor? She goes, oh. <laughs> I thought, oh, what? <laughs> she goes, what did you see? I said, yes. Oh. <laughs> and she goes, what did you see? Who's your I'm going, oh, man, what am I do here? And that's when you want an elevator to go fast. This is going, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> just, just, I got faith. I don't know what they say, it's fast, you know. 
And I said, God, I don't know. How I got. This woman think I can speak Japanese. It dawned on me. She seen my program. And she thinks I can speak Japanese. And the Lord said, talk to her. I said, I can't. I don't know no Japanese. He says, I do. I said, well, then you talk to her. You evangelize her. You help her. He said, talk to her. I'll make it work. So I'm thinking in my mind, well, thank you, ma'am. Hello. And I said, I, I said, she goes, oh. <laughs> she looked at me. And I went, <laughs> and the door opens up at, on her floor and she walks out. And the only word that came to my mind was Saranara. <laughs> she looked at me like that and thank God the door is closed. Well, I don't know what I said, <laughs> but it worked. The next day, I walk out in that pool that comes out by the Elihi Tower. You know, you know what I'm talking about there. Uh, I'm going to get a glass of iced tea or something like that. And I see her and her husband. She goes, oh, I go, oh, Jesus. <laughs> the first thing I thought of, suppose I was cussing. I mean, I don't know what I said. I mean, I could hear my, I didn't know what I was saying. And the husband comes up to me, he says, and, but he spoke English. Thank you, Jesus. He said, Brother Jesse, thank you for speaking to my wife. Huh? Oh, thank you. He said, we didn't know you could speak such good Japanese. I said, the Lord works in mysterious ways. <laughs> That's a true story. And they were just touched by it. Now, people heard that. Uh, I said, what do you do? Ah, evangelism popped up. I said, let me tell you what I do. And I become all things to all people. And if they're black people, let me tell you mm -hmm, what I can do. <laughs> hey, 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 just thought, man. You see him at the swimming pool. <clears throat> yeah, I got it, man. And I'll preach like a black Baptist. T.D. Jake says, I'm the blackest white man he's ever seen. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, Jesse, you can say things to black people. I can't. And I'm a black man. <laughs> he said, you know why? I said, why? He said, because they know you love them. I love people. You didn't have to come here today. You didn't have to come here. I ought to take Jeremy's time. No, no. <laughs> no. I mean, you did because you wanted to. You see, and I think sometimes some people think, let me bless you with my presence. Man, you could have stayed home. You got to let your light shine. That's a form of evangelism. So get them saved, but give them direction. Don't let the baby stay on the street. They're going to get hurt so they can grow to the fullness of the stature of Christ. You see? And, and one more thing. If you don't think God got a sense of humor, I was a heathen from hell before I was born again. And I mean... But my mama would taught us Bible stories and some stuff. And, and then they really got saved, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I said, I'm going to stay at the Catholic Church, Mom. I'm going to St. Gregory's, and y'all do what y'all got to do. I, she said, you got to come once a month with us. So I went, but I, I, didn't, I call it the God stuff, right? I said, I don't mess with that. So here's Kat, and I'm drinking booze. I'm talking scotch and soda, scotch and water, 7 o'clock in the morning with some eggs. I drank a lot, plus enough sin. So Kat, she gets born again by Billy, through Billy Graham. And uh, so I'm looking, I thought, I, she said, I, 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 I got born again. I said, nothing changed, Kathy. You don't do nothing wrong. You've always been a good person. What's changed? And I already had the church stuff on it. Well, I was rejecting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I said, he don't mind. Don't worry about it. I just couldn't think how she could change. But she had changed. Power began to come. Make a long story short, <laughs> which is very hard for me to do. And <laughs> I, I thought, you know. I'm going to let her do what she want to do. That's her business. But that's just not for me. But I didn't understand the power that was given to her, that wind of life. And then after she got the Holy Ghost, like I was talking about today, that wind of power. And she began to change. And she began to pray for me. And I would say, you don't need to pray for me. Jesse, you're going to hell. I said, I like hot places. <laughs> And when I got born again on Labor Day weekend, 1974, at about a quarter to nine, in a bathroom in Boston, Massachusetts, 
After I got born, I didn't even know how to pray a prayer of salvation. Believe with your heart, confess with your mouth. Jesus rose from the dead. You don't think I got, God got a sense of humor? I didn't know what to do. I went in the bathroom. I, I said, whatever Billy says. So you don't have to go through all the homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical, theological ways of doing things. That was my prayer of salvation. Whatever Billy says, bam, I got born again. God evangelized me in a bathroom. Well, there's a throne there, so I guess it's what, what, <laughs> just off the well for you, okay? And when I came out of there, Jody was three, three years old then? A month from three years, month from three years old. She looked at me and she said, Daddy not going to hell no more, Mama. Wow. Now, how did that baby know that? I said, Jody. And she had, and my daughter, you see, she got beautiful eyes. Dark, I mean, she just, she took, care, took after her mom. I mean, she got that expression of her. I said, did your mama tell you that your daddy going to hell? She said, yes. <laughs> I looked at Kathy, she said, well, it's the truth. <laughs> it was the truth, but that started out. And I've been evangelizing myself ever since. I look for the wrong thing so I can evangelize it and make it the right thing. It's not about my salvation because I'm saved by grace, but it's about my sanctification to be ye holy, for I am holy. It's been an honor and a pleasure, and I mean that sincerely. I thank you for a portion of your time. Riley, thank you for allowing me to stand behind your pulpit or whatever this thing is. And, uh, and uh, it's such a blessing, and I mean that sincerely. And we've we got to get ready here to start. So give Jesus a hand clap as Riley comes. <laughs>